So hello and welcome to the first lecture dealing with chapter 17, which brings us back to the area of thermodynamics. So we have talked about the first law of thermodynamics before, that the change in energy of the universe is zero. And like we said, energy is important. Anytime something is happening, energy is shifting in some fashion. Now consider a nice simple case. We have two flasks connected by a tube with a stopcock in the middle. One of the flasks is full of gas at some reasonable pressure, and the other is under vacuum. What's going to happen when we open the valve? Well, what's going to happen is the gas that's on the right is going to spread over to the left and eventually we'll end up with a uniform pressure throughout the whole system. That's nice. Something happened. The gas spread out. But why? No work was done. There was no pressure on the other side, so no force needed to be applied. The gases simply went in that direction until they got to the end of the flask. The pressure dropped but there was nothing pushed on. And so the gases just spread out. They didn't change temperature. They didn't lose any energy in moving from one side to the other because they were already just moving. They had the same kinetic energy. So there was no temperature change. There was no work. So where was the energy change? Because something did happen. And so why did the gas spread? Yeah, they went from the right to the left, but there are gas particles going from left to right as well. Why didn't all the particles on the right go to the left? Why don't all the particles on the left go back to the right? Neither of those ever happens. So why does this happen instead of other possibilities? So why does that happen? And the answer is entropy. So what is entropy? Entropy is actually a function of the number of energy states available to all the atoms in the system. That's not terribly helpful. It's not terribly helpful because the reality is, is that entropy, what entropy actually is, is one of the most complicated concepts in all of science. That's the bad news. The good news is you don't have to really understand what entropy is to be able to go ahead and use it. And that's what we'll do. We're going to go ahead and use it without worrying about particularly what it actually is. Something people do when they're trying to explain a really complicated idea to begin with is they come up with some sort of analogy. That is, they simplify things. And one, you'll hear various versions of simplification for entropy. The way I like to think about entropy is as a matter of choices. If I had a dollar in change in my pocket, and I put my hand in my pocket, how many different ways could I pull the coins out? Well, that would depend, of course, on what the coins were. If I had two 50 cent pieces, I'd have a choice of either bringing out zero 50 cents or a dollar. If I instead had four quarters, I could pull out zero or 25 cents or 50 cents or 75 cents or a whole dollar again. So I'd have more choices with the four quarters rather than the two 50 cent pieces. If I had 10 dimes, I could put out zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, or a whole buck. And so I'd have even more choices. And so this is the way it works. Straightforwardly, the universe wants to have choices. The one dollar represents the energy of the universe, and that's a constant. All you can do with the energy is move it around. And so basically all the universe can do with the one dollar and change is make change. That is, it can swap the coins it has for other combinations of coins. And depending on what the coins are, it has greater or fewer choices. Which brings us to the second law of thermodynamics. Second law in thermodynamics says that in any process, the entropy of the universe must increase. So if we go back to our analogy, what it amounts to 
is the universe makes change. It trades some of the coins it has for other coins. But the requirement is the exchange has to result in the universe having more choices. That is, it'll be perfectly happy to trade a nickel for five pennies, or a dime for two nickels, or a quarter for five nickels. Those would all be fine, and it would end up with more choices. What it's not going to do is it won't trade two nickels for a dime. It won't trade five pennies for a nickel, because those would reduce the number of choices it had about what, how to divide up the money. And that's what the universe is doing. It has a certain amount of energy, and it wants to divide that energy up. And it's only interested in doing things that give it more choices about dividing that energy up. Going back to our first law of thermodynamics, the change in energy of the universe is zero. And what is the change in energy of the universe? Well, it's the change in energy of the system plus the change in energy of the surroundings. And so what does the first law of thermodynamics tell us about those two quantities? Well, very simply what it says is they have to be exactly the same amount, but opposite in sign. Any energy lost by the system has to end up in the surroundings. Any energy that enters the system has to have come from the surroundings. And that's convenient. It means we don't have to keep track of both of those energies. We only need to know one or the other of them to know what they both are. The second law of thermodynamics, on the other hand, says the, the energy change in the universe is greater than or equal to zero. Well, again, the change of entropy of the universe is the change of entropy of the system plus the change of entropy of the surroundings. And so what does the second law of thermodynamics tell us about those two systems? Well, it tells us less because of that greater than or equal to sign. Does it say that one of them raises and one loser? No. Perfectly fine if they both were positive. That is, if they both went up, that'd be acceptable. Can one go up and one go down? Yes. But if that's so, then the one going up has to be more than the one going down. And so the second law of thermodynamics tells us less about the entropy of the system and the entropy of the surroundings. So what kind of form does the entropy change take? We said the entropy was a function of the energy states. So it's a function of energy. And so delta H of the process, how much energy is being shifted? The more energy that is shifted, obviously the more the entropy changes. On the other hand, it's not just a function of how much energy shifts. It's a question of how much the energy is actually being changed. To take as a simple idea, if I gave you $10,000, that would probably be a really significant change for you. On the other hand, if I sent the same $1,000 to Bill Gates, would that have any effect on his life? And the answer, of course, is no. And why not? It's because Bill Gates already has billions and billions of dollars. The $10,000 that's really important to you is a trivial amount for him. And so it's not just a question of how much energy is shifting. It's how much energy is shifting relative to how much energy is there. And the amount of energy there is, of course, a function of temperature. And so we see in the end that the, basically the change in entropy is the amount of energy shifted divided by the temperature at which the process took place. The same amount of energy shifting at low temperature is going to have a bigger effect than the, that amount of energy when the temperature is high. We can now go back to our second equation, that is the second law of thermodynamics, that the entropy change of the universe is equal to the entropy change of the system plus the entropy change of the surroundings. And we just said that the entropy change is the delta H of the process divided by temperature. Since the unit, their surroundings tend to have a lot more material than the system. They have greater choices about what to do with any given amount of energy. So we can simply replace the delta S of the surroundings with delta H divided by T. Well, not quite. We have to make a small correction. 
Delta H, of course, is the enthalpy change of the system. We're looking at the moment at the enthalpy change of the surroundings. So we have to put a minus sign in front of it so that the delta H is representing the change of enthalpy of the surroundings, not the system. And we get the nice simple equation. Well, there's a couple of things. One, the reciprocal T is kind of a pain, and that minus sign is not helpful. Well, we can get rid of both of them fairly simply. We can just multiply the whole equation through by minus T. And so on the left, we have minus T delta S of the universe equals delta H, that is the delta H of the system, minus T times the enthalpy, entropy change of the system. And now both delta H and delta S are for that of the system. And so on the left, now we have delta minus T delta S of the universe, and this is a quantity that is known as the Gibbs free energy. Not just energy, it's not simply an energy term, it's the Gibbs free energy and it's usually represented as delta G. So delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. We can set up a little table involving delta H, delta S, and delta G, and see what kind of results we get. If delta H is negative and delta S is positive, then delta G is going to be negative because both the entropy team term and the exothermic reaction will be change shifting energy favorably. And that's okay. If delta H is positive and delta S is negative, then delta G is going to be positive. But that's a problem. Because delta G is represented by three quantities. The change in entropy of the universe, the absolute temperature, and the minus sign. For delta G to be positive, therefore, since T has to be positive, and the minus sign is minus, that means the delta S of the universe would have to be negative. And the second law of thermodynamics says that absolutely ain't happening. So a result that produces a positive delta G is not going to happen. We have two other possibilities. That is, where both delta H and delta S have the same sign, for example, plus and plus. Well now, when we add them together, one's going to be positive and one quantity is going to be negative. And it's going to depend on which one is larger, whether we get a positive or negative answer. And what's going to affect which one is larger? Well, we have one more variable. We have the temperature. And so when delta H and delta S have the same sign, either both positive or both negative, then the result for delta G is going to depend on what temperature you're talking about. For delta H plus and entropy plus at a low temperature, the entropy is going to be dominated by the delta H, and delta G would be positive and therefore not happen. But at high temperature, at some point, the delta S term would become larger than the delta H term, and the number would start being negative, which would mean something would actually be able to happen. Conversely, if they're both negative, then the delta H term dominates at a low temperature, and the reaction will run along merrily at a low temperature. But as you heat the process up, the entropy term will start taking over, and the reaction will no longer become favorable. So now we have an equation that gives us an expectation whether something is going to happen or not happen, whether it's going to happen occasionally or it's going to happen all the time or whether it's never going to happen. And that's where we're going to have to take it up in our next lecture on thermodynamics. Have a good day.